So, welcome everyone. My name is Ben, and today I'll be talking to you about Japan and its cybersecurity scene. So firstly, who am I? I'm a cybersecurity consultant for a Japanese cybersecurity company called Nihon Cyber Defense. Uh, during my time with NCD, I specialize in cyber threat intelligence. And for the past three years, I have um, been fortunate to call both Tokyo and Belfast home. So on that note, let's get this all come away. So what am I actually going to be talking to you about? Well, to start off, we'll be examining Japan and its cybersecurity landscape before exploring the issues that plague it. Then, to finish it off, I'll be discussing what Japan needs to do next to step up its cybersecurity game. So, now for the next question. Why am I standing up here talking about Japan? To most people, Japan is the land of anime, weird TV shows, amazing food, massive meds, and wacky futuristic technology. <laughs> but maybe some of you may even call it one of the kings of technology. However, when you look behind its curtain, you find the world's, uh, the world's third biggest economy that contains global household names, including Toyota, Canon, Sony, and Nintendo. But Japan has also been in the international spotlight over the last few years, as it's uh, due to its hosting of significant global events, such as the uh, Tokyo 2020 Olympics and the recent 49th G7 summit. But what does Japan mean for us as cybersecurity professionals? Well, for many of you who call Belfast and the rest of the UK home, Japan has become a close ally in recent years because of things like the Free Trade Agreement, the Hiroshima Accord, the Global Combat Air Program that we share with Italy, and Japan's allies have also increased in numbers recently with the recent partnerships with Australia and the recent trilateral movement Trilateral uh, Leader Summit at Camp David uh, this August. Now, why are these partnerships important to us as individuals interested in cybersecurity and outside of Japan? Well, hopefully majority of you know Japan's interesting neighbours, such as China, North Korea and Russia, and of their recent cyber activity that has impacted not just Japan, but the global landscape. And understandably, Japan has found itself on the front lines of the cyber world with one question needing an answer. Is Japan secure against cyber attacks? Unfortunately, the answer isn't yes or no, but the same does come to mind. Defences are only as strong as their weakest link. And when it comes to cyber security, Japan is still in the age of slammer eyes compared to its allies and enemies. So why is Japan the weakest link? Well, let me introduce you to this gentleman, Admiral C. Dennis, uh, well, uh, Admiral Dennis C. Blair. Admiral Dennis, uh, uh, Admiral Dennis C. Blair is a former US Director of National Intelligence and has, has had a specific interest in the uh, Indo-Pacific region in recent years. He recently conducted a review of the US's closest allies and their cyber compliance and discovered Japan was the lowest in class. And last year he even described Japan as being in the minor baseball league compared to the rest of the US allies like Australia and the UK. So does that mean any consequences? You know, ultimately someone has to be the weakest link. Unfortunately, yes. One consequence for Japan has been economic. One case of this is of the recent $80 billion contract from the US Department of Defense, which was awarded to a Japanese company, but six months later was dropped by the DOD because they weren't reassured of the company's cyber resilience. Right, okay, Japanese private sector is struggling, but does that mean the public sector and everything else is well, the private sector is only the tip of the iceberg. The public sector includes the government ministries, and have had, which have had their own cybersecurity issues, as seen in the recent Washington Post, talking about the US's experiences of Japan's maelstrom of cybersecurity issues over the past few years. Now, this does include a compromise of Japan's cyber network, uh, cyber defense network by Chinese for actors, which has taken over a year to resolve. Now, this is only just one example. The, uh, Japan's 
Centre of uh, National National Centre on Incident Readiness and Strategy for Cybersecurity disclosed breach of their email system only last month. And actually, one of the oddest instances from this year was a compromise of 261 river surveillance cameras across the Kansai region. Now, this all supports Japan being the weakest link, although every country has its horror stories. However, most of these instances aren't being brought up by the Japanese authorities or ministries, but by external sources like the US and other security researchers. But what happens if the situation was recognised from the inside? Well, let me introduce you to someone else, uh, Amari Akira. Uh, Amari San was the former Secretary General of Japan's leading political party, the LDP. So why is a Japanese politician the key to recognising Japan's cybersecurity situation. Well, back in October last year, Amari San was representing the Japanese government at a large international cybersecurity conference in uh, Tokyo, where he was talking about Japan's situation and mentioned some of the things that Dennis C. Blair had said about Japan. But what caught my interest is what he said about Dennis C. Blair's baseball minor league comment. He expressed he was actually surprised by the review and he thought that the review was too generous. And as Amari san as Amari san actually sees Japan being in the baseball school league. Now, I expect none of you actually expected that, to be honest. Another interesting point from his speech was in preparation, was in preparation for the latest full review of Japan's key infrastructure action plan that's coming into effect soon. A cyber risk assessment was conducted of 14 major Japanese infrastructure sectors, including electricity, gas, water, etc. So what did the assessment find? Well, one major finding was that they discovered exactly 877 cyber risks. Now that isn't great, but it should be zero, but it could be a lot higher. So what else did the assessment find? Well, it was determined that many places didn't actually have an established cyber incident response, or security mechanisms. Now, I don't think anyone here wants to hear your critical infrastructure has no plan on what to do if it was targeted by a cyber attack. But it could be worse. It's not like someone doesn't know the possible risks and threats. Well, actually, the assessment found one person who was responsible for managing some water infrastructure who didn't actually know what cyber risk was, and they actually never heard of it. So I think we've established there's a problem. So, the question is, how does the shogun of technology end up like this? Well, Japan faces many challenges. And many of these challenges actually impact not just cyber, but the whole of Japan. These challenges are aging population, shortage of workforce, and old technology. And this isn't just me saying this. The government of Japan in its 2021 cyber security strategy highlighted there is a shortage of workforce caused by Japan's aging population, which has led to Japan depending on foreign, country, foreign countries and organisations for their cybersecurity capability. And yes, okay, Japan might have some of the most advanced technology, but that doesn't mean day-to-day technology is new. I mean, how many of you actually know what a fax machine is, let alone how to use it? Another societal issue is losing face. We've all lost face and tried to save face. To be honest, being embarrassed is part of life. But when it comes to Japanese organisations, saving face is a critical, life-saving skill in the Japanese market. Now, in my opinion, losing face is one of the biggest problems Japan society faces. The issues that can come with losing face sometimes result in bad solutions to get around the issues that it produces. And in the cybersecurity world, that isn't good. An example of trying to save face in the cyber world is when companies don't admit they've been breached for months which then lead to more problems. Now, one of the main reasons for this is because um, C-suites often will get fired or asked to resign, and when it comes to telling the public, the Japanese don't exactly do it peacefully, as I assume that most, people, most of you have seen the large press conferences with flashing lights and their whole board doing a 45-degree angle bang. Now, what about something more close to home, something more cybersecurity-centric? Well, this figure from PwC is quite old now, but it is still relevant to this day, as there actually has been much improvement in the sharing of threat intelligence. 
Now, to be clear, there's been some really good utilization of threat intelligence, not just by Japanese companies, but by around the company, uh, by countries around the world. Although that's not sharing cyber threat intelligence. So why is that? Well, there were four reasons given in the report. And when I think about those four reasons, given back in 20, uh, 2016, I think maybe they could be solved through, through something like an ISAC. Uh, for those who don't know, an ISAC stands for Information Sharing and Analysis Center. They would provide a framework to process the intelligence. They'd act as a neutral organization in any market. They wouldn't be a competitor, and they could be trusted with the information. Plus, organizations could share the information with an ISAC through many methods like a fax machine. Unfortunately, there's one problem that was bugging me when I first thought of this. Why has no one else thought of it? The answer is they have, and, as, and they're actually quite a few. And as you may notice, some of them are actually older than the PwC report, so maybe there's another reason. Well, one other possible reason that was given is there is too many bottlenecks of information currently. Both Dennis e. Blair and Amari San acknowledged there was an issue of sharing intelligence. One of the reasons for this is even though Japan has a national center of incident readiness and strategy for cybersecurity, it still needs a command center and clear incentives to sharing the information. Another topical issue is Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. It's become a massive topic in recent years, with all the military activity seen by Japan's interesting neighbours. So what is Article 9? Article 9 basically states that Japan has no right to wage war or declare war, and therefore does not allow, does not, is not allowed the capability to maintain offensive capability. That includes land, air, sea, space. And interestingly enough, it does apply to cyber. And that's where red team falls into. Now, this has led to hesitation in terms of having a red team for even defensive reasons. Now, okay, let's be honest, domestically, it's not really a problem. But at a national level, where you're going to test a network and systems, like it's going to be targeted by an ATP factor, you're going to have a head-scratching moment. There's actually one last thing that dragged cybersecurity in the art- into the Article 9 discussion spotlight. Counteractive defences, e.g. hackbacks. So here's a question to think about for a second. Does Japan's constitution allow their government to defensively counteract threats and disasters? So, how does Japan go from being in the lowest in the class to an all-star player? Well, firstly, actually, I think we should recognise some of the positives. And Mori-san himself said he's not actually totally in despair of the situation in Japan. Why is that? Well, he noted during his speech that the UK suffered 2 million cyber attacks during the 2012 Olympics. But that record was actually broken during the 2020 Olympics, where over 450 million attacks were identified and mitigated. Now, this is the result of government agencies and large private sector companies like NTT working together. What about more recently? Well, these three points listed on the slides are updates from the Japanese government from the past few months. Now, this ranges from increasing the number of cyber-related personnel in the Ministry of Defence to new legislation that will cover cybersecurity succession costs to an information network that will assist specific island countries that have weak cybersecurity countermeasures. And these are only three updates. There are plenty more, and new ones come out quite regularly. Before we have a look at what Japan should do next, there's actually one last positive. So after I submitted this talk, I actually got some feedback. Why does it matter to Belfast? Well, actually, it doesn't specifically relate to Belfast, as let's be honest, it's a talk about Japanese cybersecurity. But whilst I was writing this talk, I came across this. This is an umbrella univer- uh, uh, organization which is made up of universities from the UK, the US, and Japan, which holds an international capture the flag for, for the students of the universities within the organization. Now, this is, cool and, this is all cool and everything. Although I did notice something. A new university joined at the beginning of this year, and I don't think you'll guess which one. Queen's University, Belfast. Great. So, all these positives are great and everything, but this is only the start. So, how does Japan go from being in the lowest class in all star play? Well, the first thing should be talking about the challenges it faces, no matter how uncomfortable the discussion gets. Secondly, in my opinion, Japan should take on the UK's national model. Now, to be clear, the model on the slide, which is probably fashion currently, for a little bit, um, is a simplified version. 
of the cybersecurity strategy for the past few years. However, it is still valid compared to the more recent ones. And I've been using this model to check to see how Japan has been doing over the past few years. So let's actually go through it. Does it have a national cybersecurity center? Well, it does have a national center of incident readiness and strategy for cybersecurity. And they also have a cybersecurity council as part of their basic act on cybersecurity. But as mentioned in the talk, they don't actually have a command center, somewhere which will take the reins. Okay, what about collaboration? Well, the purpose of the council is actually to enhance information sharing between the members of the council and to help promote cybersecurity. But sharing information is still at a low, and this is because of things that, are list that were listed, and also the fact that social norms like saving face has impacted it. What about awareness? Well, the Japanese do take part in Cyber Awareness Month and the National Center of Incident Readiness and Strategy for Cybersecurity regularly release blogs about cyber threats. But this is not on the level of countries like the UK where cyber hygiene is talked about from a young age upwards. Finally, capacity. Well, the government's plans to increase the total number of cyber-related personnel in the Ministry of Defence will start filling the gap. But that isn't a solution for the private sector. There is still a lack of educational routes to cybersecurity in Japan, which would provide the workforce that is required for the Japanese market. So to sum this up, Japan is making some good progress, but there's still a long route ahead of them. Now, ultimately, this is only a glimpse of what Japan's cybersecurity scene actually looks like. So what do I want people to take away from this book? Well, apart from the usual message of encouraging people to have a look at Japan and cybersecurity scene, the main message is to recognize there will always be a weakest link when it comes to things like cybersecurity, partnerships, and supply chains. But we, as a cybersecurity industry, are responsible for making sure that those weak links and all the other links in the chain are as strong as possible for the day when someone decides to break the chain. Thank you very much. Any questions? If I have time. So uh, there's actually two points I want to make with this really quickly. Yes, possibly. But here's a question for you as such. Let's say the US and, and China in, the, in a couple of years' time decide they're actually buddy-buddy and Japan gets removed from that umbrella. What should Japan do? This is the point of this talk and the point of why I'm talking about this is to say, in many ways, and Japan is recognising this, you can't rely on other people. You have to rely on yourself. And the Japanese... the Japanese government recognised that in the 2021 uh, cybersecurity strategy, which talked about, hey, we're depending on foreign countries and organisations for security. We need to work on it ourselves. Any other questions? Yes, with the right things done. Now, this is where I could make a sales pitch, but I'm not going to. <laughs> um, but with the way things are looking, yes. And the, one of the points that I hadn't actually put in this talk was there's actually a lot of discussion around Article 9. And the uh, information network that I mentioned is actually looking to do hackbacks. They are looking at basically rewriting the way that they read Article 9. So ultimately, will they catch up? Yes. But it will be comparing it to their closest allies, like the US and the UK, maybe not as quickly. But I think with the realisation currently going on in the glo in in globally, eventually, yes, they will catch up to an specific level and hopefully will become a part of the workforce that we're seeing trying to keep the whole of the globe safe instead of just being their own. Any other questions? Thank you very much, then.